Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined in studio today by Scott and uh, President. It's great to see you. Well, it's great to see you, and it's a terrific day to be here. If Cedar City is known for anything, aside from uh, the red rock around us and uh, national parks and a rather consistent wind, it would probably be the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Utah's only Tony Award-winning theater. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh, a a pretty remarkable commendation for a little rural southern Utah town. (laughs) That's right. And it's part of Southern Utah University, so we get to be involved in it, which makes it all the better for us. And we're going to talk about the Utah Shakespeare Festival and their summer season this that's currently underway. But within the framework, as we always do, as a solution for higher education, um, the, the framework of tolerance. So would you introduce our guest? Yes, we have Michael Barr. Michael, welcome. Hey, how are you? Terrific. So Michael is the... Director of Education Programs, the Education Director for the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Correct. Which means that you spend your life educating people. I do. Uh, I I love, as you know, uh, playing in the classroom, playing uh, basically on the stages, playing everywhere. In fact, uh, I have an acronym, uh, PLAY, Performance Learning for Active Youth. It's the best way for us to learn is through play. That's that's how we... that's how we learned as babies, and it's how we learn now. And I actually think, in regards to Shakespeare, it's how we learn as well. Uh, the plays teach us things. Playing and watching people play. That's correct. Yep. It's a great way to learn. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Hamlet, uh, when he's trying to catch the conscience of the king, when he's trying to uh, see whether or not his uncle is guilty or not, uh, he says, you know, the play's the thing wherein we'll catch the conscience of the king. But he also talks about holding the mirror up to nature so that we can actually see ourselves. And that, for me, is what, uh, I mean, that's the definition of theater. Um, we're seeing ourselves up on stage and seeing us created there. So how wonderful that we get to have this conversation, not only about the Utah Shakespeare Festival, but uh, about... About how, some of the themes for the year. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is an interesting way to look at it, that that a play holds a mirror up to us. Mm -hmm. If it didn't, it wouldn't seem as relevant. Correct. And if it didn't, it wouldn't last hundreds of years. We're looking at plays that are 400 years old and are still relevant today. And that's why uh, we weep. It's why we laugh. Um, And we could just jump right into the plays that we're doing this. I mean, this season in particular... Uh, was intentionally designed to talk about tolerance, to talk about um, uh, civility, uh, how we relate to one another. I like to use the term, and we just had a scholars conference where this was the theme, um, and we called it Shakespeare and the Other. How do we, how do we look at those that are different, or when we are? excluded within a group and every mm-hmm. single play including our non-shakespeare plays had to do with that same type that of same thing. topic yeah and when we talk about tolerance it's more than just tolerating <laughs> oh, yeah but it's I, a, we, we, we use the word tolerance because it's so much a part of our language but i'm not sure if i do you like the word tolerance because it's well, it, I, it, it's like rather than realizing that <laughs> let me use a play so you've I, got Merry Wives of Windsor, right? If you tolerate someone, they're just kind of sitting there as opposed to yeah. including. Including. And you becoming bigger and better because of this this person being in the room with you. Yeah, and I've, this is not, these are not my words. And, and they're not the right words, but they're close. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing, of right? course. Tolerance is like inviting somebody 
to the party. Right. And inclusion is asking them to dance. That, that's right. <laughs> so this, the, the fact that we're going to tolerate somebody is as good as including them. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, but nevertheless, tolerance is a word that we associate with. We need to have more tolerance. Yeah, so so for me— We need to be less intolerant. Correct. Um, the, the act of including— actually makes the art better. When you set up a rehearsal room and you invite somebody into the rehearsal process that is a voice you haven't necessarily heard before, the work that goes on stage is going to be better because the ideas are going to be greater. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, particularly in this year, I'm going to talk about Merchant of Venice. Um, Merchant of Venice is a play that was very, very popular. It was one of the first plays produced actually in America long ago, 1600s. Um, And then as we as a country became more conscious about what's happening within that play, um, you've got a character, Shylock, who Shakespeare wrote with a brushstroke of humanity. Um, Christopher Marlowe also wrote a play about a Jewish character in a very negative light. Shylock you can see the shades of humanity in him, which allows him to say, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, you know, and feelings. So you've got this Jewish character who's abused through it. And as we perform it today, it's sometimes uncomfortable for our audiences to see what happens at the ends of that play. I mean, he's forced to convert. They say, we'll give you, we'll give you half of your money back. Uh, but you'll have to convert and become a Christian. And we kind of wrinkle as a modern audience. How do they deal with that? So it's opened up really beautiful conversations in our seminar groves and post-show. Um, our Thunderbird program, we, where we invite a lot of our new incoming freshmen to see it, a lot of the classes want to see that play so that they can kind of open up and kind of talk about that. So let's let's um, make sure that um, we know what we're Talking, talking about, about it. What you're saying is, is that we have this um, play, Merry Wives. Prior yeah. to the play... Merry Wives or a, Merchant of Venice? What did I say? Oh, Merchants Merchant, of Venice. Merchant right, of Venice, right, yeah. right, right, right. But Mary, we're doing Merry Wives, too, which also deals with an other in a different way. But yeah. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I said it wrong. So prior to the play, there's a seminar. It's kind mm-hmm. of an introductory, mm-hmm. not a really a seminar, but an introduction. Orientation. Orientation. Mm-hmm. And then the next morning after it's... Done, then there's a seminar. Correct. Which goes for about an hour, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Where everybody gets to sit around and talk about what happened. Right. The play. Yep. That's one of the things that makes the Utah Shakespeare Festival so spectacular. Why we have people coming here from Washington, D.C., and Florida, and all over mm-hmm. is because if you go see a play somewhere else, they don't have this orientation. And then the next morning, they don't have a Can, can a I tell seminar. you what? This literally happened this morning. I was running the seminar this morning. And this couple came up to me and they said, we loved that show last night, but we were so disturbed. We, we couldn't go to bed. We kept talking about it. And we're so glad we were able to come this morning and talk with other people about what this play made us think about. Um, and the specific issue, this, this play is closing, um, but the specific issue they talked about is Melinda Funstein, our director the the play in Shakespeare's day ends with this kind of wonderful comedy comic ending where Bassanio is able to marry who he wants to marry. Graciano is able to marry who he's supposed to marry. And they just kind of laugh and dance and it's a fun little ending. They exchange rings. There's, and it's a comedy. And at the same time, literally happening simultaneously while these jokes are being told up on the balcony, you see these two people of the law come out and start to do a forced conversion for Shylock while that is going on simultaneously. And uh, you're laughing, and then you look up and you see what's happening up there, and we go, oh, that is happening at the expense of this. This would not be happening if this forced conversion wasn't happening. And the patrons were just a buzz, talking about this is like the Crusades. This is like, wow, how does that make us feel? What about the daughter Jessica? And now I'm getting into the more intricate parts of it. <laughs> but uh, it was just thrilling. 
watching the audience just pop about, you know, what, uh, hearing a line in Shakespeare's play, see if this line sounds familiar, where the, the Christian characters are saying, you know, we don't like Shylock, but we like Jessica because she's pretty and it looks like she can be a Christian. So we'll let her be a Christian. Again, heavy, heavy, heavy things. And this was written 400 years ago. I mean, Shakespeare is writing this 400 years ago and and kind of putting those issues out there. I don't think it matters. The play means nothing unless you talk about it and start to process it and see how that kind of makes you feel and wrinkle. One of the patrons also said this morning that at the end of the show, they wanted to clap because that was the appropriate thing to do, but they felt like weeping because of what they saw there on on stage. And um, these are... Yeah. These are humans, human, again, holding the mirror up to nature. So this play was written about 400 years ago. Mm-hmm. It looks to me like we've pretty much solved the intolerance issues. Oh, it's we? done. We've solved yeah. it. Yeah, isn't yeah. it nice? <laughs> I, one, of the, one of the things I do every year is... Not I, a concern anymore. Yeah, yeah. I go to Los Angeles and, and conduct um, music for services at the Synagogue for the Performing Arts, and have done so for... This is my 32nd year yeah, now. Yeah. And one of the most moving moments of the Yom Kippur service is when um, when the congregants engage in a prayer that essentially says, any vows that we were forced to take during the year, we are released wow. from. And it, wow. so it dates back to that to that time of the crusades and yeah. and other times of forced conversion where uh, where folks who who were forced against their will on under you know yeah. uh, threat of death to convert to something else or they were they were threatened to say something or threatened to, that they had to do something or be killed yeah um, could still maintain good status um, you know, in in the rule and law of Judaism, yeah, and so it, it's that's always one of the most moving parts yeah. of that ceremony. I mean, I'm always reminded of that um, with the Shiloh within character. this within this yeah. show. Um, it's an interesting show too because it's not just the Jewish Christian relationship that's discussed, but as Portia is trying to find a husband, her husband. Um, has to be a rich man and has to be a wealthy man and uh, deserve her. And her father, before he passes away, he sets up this test. And he said, before you are married, you have to come. And if you, and they have to select the right um, box, essentially. They call it a casket in the show, but the right box. So there's a gold, a silver, and a lead. And we see this test of these uh, suitors that come in. And the first suitor you see is a suitor from Morocco. Now, way back in 19, I guess it was maybe 82 or 83, I saw Benjamin Bratt, the actor, Benjamin Bratt, uh, perform that scene. Um, He's a Hispanic actor. He came in, and and it's generally, even back in Shakespeare's day, performed in a quite comic fashion. He comes in and full of himself, and he chooses gold um, to get there, swings a scimitar around and, and whatever Shakespeare thought of the Moroccans uh, does that that way. And then you have the Prince of Aragon who comes in and he's also full of himself and then Bassanio comes in. So that's that's the trope. That's the story. Um, this year, as I was watching, I went, oh, wow. They've cast Jamil, a man of Arabic descent, to play the Prince of Morocco. And I thought, Wow. How does that feel? And he says, oh, it's not the first time I've been cast as the Prince of Morocco before. And then when he plays it, it was not comic. It was not shticky. And I thought, oh, how interesting that would have been to be in the rehearsal room where you actually have. And I said, so why did you choose not to do this comically, but instead seriously? And he said, because the text says he's a fine, upstanding man. Why, why, wouldn't, why do we have to play this in this comic? And I think that's a perfect example of how inclusion within the room suddenly, you know, it's easy for me as a Caucasian of Scottish and German descent to say, hey, I want this comic Moroccan. But for a man of Saudi Arabian descent to walk in and say, no, this is a noble man who really wants the hand of Portia. 
and these lines he's saying he really wants wants this and I'm going to play that and that that allowed me to see wow I never I never thought of that and you saw how he informed again not in not tolerance inclusion allowing a, an arab to come in and play that role suddenly gives us a different and informs the work in a different way yeah just having just having more people in the room when we're doing the conversation. Correct. Yep. Or yeah. putting together the... Yeah. Uh, putting together the ensemble and ensuring that every voice in the room should have that. And an audience is the same way. People have very different reactions. Merchant of Venice, um, when the tables are turned on Shylock, because he is also, um, at times he's painted as a villain because, you know my daughter, my ducats, you know, where's all my money? Where's all my money? The term Shylock, the term Jew has become associated with because of the strength and the negative stereotypes that have come out of this show. So within the the trial, when all of a sudden the tables are turned on him uh, and Graciano uh, starts yelling things, audiences will start to laugh when they see him being put back in his place, because that's the way Shakespeare designed it. But I found that modern audiences laugh in uncomfortableness, but begin to think a little more about what's kind of happening on stage because of modern uh, influences of that. So mm. again, it's, it's telling, I think. Well, this is one view of this and one of the plays in the season, mm -hmm. of which there are many. We also have Othello, <laughs> which is a fairly obvious uh, when you think of it. We go, oh, Othello. Oh, that's the show with the black guy in it. Um, but there's a lot more going on in that show um, than, than meets the eye. Uh, we also have the show Merry Wives of Windsor, uh, about a small town with Falstaff. Falstaff is this uh, uh, large, rotund comic character who wants to bed two married women. But within this town, we also have Dr. Caius, who is a Frenchman. We also have a Welshman. They're always making jokes about cheese and apples and uh, those type of jokes. Um, we're also doing within this season uh, Big River, which is Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn with the great music by Roger Miller. Uh, and that's a very obvious Huck going down Oh, yeah. You know, with, with uh, Jim. Uh, we also have a less obvious, but every bit as powerful, The Foreigner, uh, which was written back in 1983, but also has all sorts of resonance in regards to what do we do when someone who's not like us comes into a room and then we all either choose to accept or, or not accept. Um, so, again, uh, I don't think plays preach to us. I think they teach us. We hold them up and then it's our responsibility to look and say, okay, well, what did we, is that how we feel? Is that not how we feel? Um, is this the way I behave? Yeah. Or how different is my behavior than this behavior? Correct. Yeah. You know, the, these two plays, The Foreigner and Big River are interesting ones. Um, Big River is a uh, fascinating play because particularly um, in reading the book mm -hmm. carefully mm -hmm. you, you see that Jim is the most upright moral person in the entire story mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to find somebody 1884, 1885 too, it, pretty amazing that this character, this uh, African American, this black character is painted in this way. But if you look at Duke or you look at the King, yeah. uh, even even Huck himself admits to his malleableness. Uh, he, we have an anti-hero who is kind of the protagonist there in in Huck, but Jim, stalwart, one dream. I've got to find my family. I'm going out to find my family, and uh, yeah, yeah. That's a such a. And the language of the play is hard for some. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I th intentionally, uh, many, many N-words within the text itself, obviously minimized, and then selective N-words that are chosen, which have had interesting reactions to people in our audience. When you see this amazing 
opera trained actor uh, Ezekiel who's playing Jim who sings free at last and sings that and then the next scene you hear that n-word juxtaposed right opposite there there's a visceral reaction in the audience so I I think that when Mark Twain wrote this the the n-word was already going out of fashion Mm -hmm. he he intentionally created the the this this feeling Mm -hmm. that the word used to describe Jim was debasing. Right. But painted him as the best person in the story. Right. It's an interesting... Juxtaposition. Yeah, it really is interesting. The, the, in the play and the book, I mean, the key, the key question Huck says, uh, should I, should I go to hell that's and right, help right. him, or should I, or should I do the right thing and sell this piece of property, you know, back, so that I'm in line with my morals? And we know at the beginning how he feels about Widow Douglas and, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, read your Bible, Huck, and do all this type of stuff. And ah, I don't want any of the civilization thing. Or should I be a dirty abolitionist? So framed in the, you know. Christianity kind of turned on its head. So he does the what we would call now the Christian thing and assists. But so the question is, what would you go to hell for? You know? well, yeah, right. And the, the, the conflicts that a person feels in a culture where it's a hard, it's a hard thing for Huck Finn mm-hmm. yeah. to try to figure out what voice he's supposed to listen to. Yeah. Can I tell you another moment I love that I never thought of? I've been with this show for a long time. I, I knew about it when it first came out, uh, being a theater guy. I've been involved in productions of it. And the last scene, it's a very funny scene where Tom Sawyer, because he loves a wild adventure, you know, complicates the process and finally, you know, um, makes it possible for him to get out. And then tells Jim that he was doing all of these things. And Jim said, you know... <laughs> I wish I would have known that I was free ahead of time. Why did you do this? And he said, oh, you had no idea about my plans. Uh, it would have gone on. Our adventure would have gone on and on and on and on. And we could have saved it for our children to let you out. And that line has never hit me the same way. It was, it was just a comic line in the past. I go, well, I'll wait until our children can let you free. And I went, oh, man. And I don't know if William Hoffman, the guy who wrote this script, or... I don't know what they meant by that, but what I took away when I heard that, I went, oh, have we done the same thing? Are we kind of kicking that can down the road? Yeah. Are we pushing that down Somebody the road? Somebody else is going to solve this. Somebody else will solve this. Somebody else will solve this. Or is that just one of those muse things where, you know, a Twain and this really great musical put together, uh, and then he sings actually free at last right after that. And I had never, even though I was introduced to the show like, like 20 plus years ago, I'd never seen that juxtaposition. He said, you had no idea what I was planning. I was going to wait until, and our children, you know, could let you out. And then we've got that free at last song after that. We go, wow. Huh. Have we kicked the can down the road? Yeah. Yep. The time is always right now. Yep. Yep. The Foreigner is a... F- uh, <laughs> A fun play to watch. Yep. And comedy. It might be the funniest play I think I've seen in a while. Yeah. And it's done so incredibly well yep. here. Mm-hmm. But wow, it is kind of shocking to watch the KKK walk onto the stage. Yeah. I mean, this is a fun, happy, goof off sort of play. Nice and comedy it, with the KKK yeah, that shows up, comedy. right? And then all of a sudden it starts getting dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then. And then the KKK's walking around the stage. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, oh, wow. Which is interesting because when it came out in 1984, 84, um, Matthew Broderick on Broadway started it. And there's beautiful reviews that talk about his, his comedy and silences and how he, he played the character of Charlie. Um, quick context in case anybody hasn't seen it. And it is playing all the way through the fall so you can come back and see it. We also did this show in the early 2000s but it didn't have the resonance that it has today, which I find interesting. And I tell our crowds that, uh, isn't that interesting that this play, which is about 34 years old, has this resonance now. And that's because of the baggage 
that we're all bringing in. When we picked this show two years ago, a year and a half ago, what a great kind of light comedy that we can pull in to talk about inclusion and to talk about, you know, isn't it great to work and be happy with those that are different from us? And we've had patrons who say, did, did you write that play? Who, <laughs> did, did you add those lines? So, I mean, there are lines, of cert, there are lines that certain characters say within it that sound very much like um, dark forces that we might be hearing today. That again, back in the 80s, you know, KKK was a bit of a punchline. So why is it that now this comedy has this resonance? And I actually think it's evidence of a really great play, a play that... A good play is universal. A good play lasts for that long period of time. Like Shakespeare, you know, we're still doing it. There's still things that we can find in this production. Michael, when, when this play came out in the 80s, The Foreigner, mm -hmm. the reviews and all mm -hmm. this, I don't, was there in the reviews a, a discussion about this is a great play about inclusion and... <laughs> Avoiding <laughs> intolerance and all that kind of stuff. No, they describe, and you can actually get online and look at the New York Times review for Matthew Broderick. Um, and it talks about, um, now we're kind of talking around the show, so I feel like um, patrons who are listening need to know what it's about. But it's about an awkwardly shy British man who um, is brought by his friend to the woods of Georgia uh, to kind of get away from his hard life that he's having. And uh, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. And so his friend says, tell you what, I'll, t I'll tell them that you're a foreigner. And uh, and then you don't have to talk to any of them. Well, just assume and, you can't speak English. Yeah, we'll just say that you can't speak English. And so uh, Betty, who is, uh, she's the proprietor of this kind of hunting lodge up in the sticks of Georgia, um, uh, she just loves the fact that a foreigner is with her. And it means he lists he gets to listen to a lot of conversations that he probably shouldn't be listening to. And he hears about that. And, he, and then he has a choice. Do I help this or do I not help that? And every single, it's not just Charlie who's the foreigner. Um, Ellard, the awkward, in the 80s we would have called a halfwit, but he's not a halfwit. He learns differently. <laughs> and our director chose, our director actually taught for about seven years in a public high school. And he said, I'd like you to see, what if he were kind of a different learner? What if he were on the spectrum? Somebody so we were, that had a learning disability. Yeah, had a learning disability yeah. or a learning diffability. Diffability. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so that, you know, how, what if he learns and, and does that? So that's why it, you see through the play with him playing with those gadgets. And then they come together to solve this problem when people who don't know what to do with someone who's foreign, um, hence the KKK coming on stage, um, it's, it's lighthearted. It's funny. I think it's funny because it's true. I think comedy like this is really difficult because it has to... Owen, who is the uh, the guy who doesn't like the outsiders there, uh, he has to ring a chord too. We have to say, well, we've heard this before. So when it comes out, they describe the plot. They describe that, but it was a little bit more of a punchline. It was less about you know, inclusion, but it's interesting that those same ideas kind of stay with us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're talking about in the eighties, talk about in the early two thousands, talk about it. And we're still talking about that too. We're still talking about it. The, yeah. But the, but the play seems to be far more relevant today than when it was written. That's <laughs> yeah. what's so interesting about it. Yeah. And, and perhaps some of these Shakespeare plays, they, they seem more relevant today than when they were written. Yeah. Yeah. So why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, I think it, oh, go ahead. I, well, I was going to say, I want to ask you the question. Um, uh, I, I think we've had audiences that have been touched by it because of what they're going through personally. So we go to the temple of the theater to try to get right with ourselves and try to get right, right with God, right? And with the collective humanity. I like comparing, <laughs> I like comparing theaters to temples, but it's a real active and alive temple. But it it's there to make you ask questions. And a lot of times when you're done with a play, you don't get answers at the end of a play. You get more questions, which tells you that the play probably did what it was supposed to. Right? Yeah. Um, so firing that question at you, why is it more relevant? You know, why, why, why does that relevance come? Well, if we follow your metaphor that a play is like holding up a mirror to the audience. Mm -hmm. If the audience is not 
quite as focused on inclusion, then you're not going to see that as well. Right. So, But today, we bec- we're, we're, we're becoming so much more interested in inclusion. In the 1980s, nobody used the word inclusion. Mm-mm. It was tolerance. Yeah. So we can tolerate you. You be yourself, and I'll be myself, and we're okay. At least that's the way I kind of see it. But but today, if or, you... Or it, diverse... The other word that they used, or at least the one that I was raised with as I was beginning to teach, was diversity. So are you diverse? Is your yeah. campus diverse? And I think those were well-intentioned academics trying to use those terms. But I think the term the term diversity still implies separation as opposed to what's it like to sit in a room with someone that I don't know anything about and is not like me and I'm going to learn from you and become a better person and community as a whole, right? Yeah. So I think it took society a while to come around to my job is not just to tolerate. My job is not just to be diverse but my job is to include. Um, yeah, and to suggest that we're all different yeah. is to suggest that we can remain in a state of not understanding one another. Right, right. And accept that. Right. But to suggest that diversity has a point, and the point is is to help us become more inclusive people, then, yeah. then the task is totally different. It's not oh, that's really nice. We've got one of you and one of you and one of you here. Yeah. It's, wow, my life is more fulfilled because I have you as friends Correct. and you as a friend and you as a friend, and I understand things so much better And I think, I think uh, if the whole podcast, that's what we need to take away from this podcast because that, yeah. uh, my life and my children's lives, um, for, for whatever reason, we moved around a lot. And consequently, my children were exposed to many different types of cultures. And I'm really, really grateful that they had that opportunity to be uh, not just difference, but best friends, and because that makes us all kind of better, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, so the mirror that was held up to the audience in the 1980s reflects something different than a mirror that's held up to an audience in the 20s. 18, but isn't summer it, season in Cedar City. Isn't Utah it interesting in The Festival. Foreigner that at the end they vanquish the problem when a very uh, varied and different group come together when Catherine the debutante and Ellard the guy who learns differently and uh, Betty Meeks who's never been out of her house before but really enjoys these different when they all rallied and Charlie who's never been out did, how does he start the show he doesn't think he has a personality and then discovers that he has a has a personality when they all come together they vanquish the the threat uh, in different and unique in unique ways and again I think uh, I give credit to Larry Shu the playwright um, who was able to provide that for us so that that's many years from now we can kind of look at that um, it's it's why I like working for the Utah Shakespeare Festival because the the season that we select the shows that we select are just um, our job is to educate enrich and entertain but we're going to challenge you too we, w- we want you to, we want you to have a good time, but we want to challenge um, and hopefully send you out thinking so that tomorrow is another day. The good time is the honey that, that draws in the fly. Yes, yeah. And then our job, once we get there, is to try to learn something. Steve, Steve you made a really interesting comment a while ago when I was present. Uh, <laughs> That's... <laughs> That oh, strikes only, me as unusual. But I, would I thought that. you were only brilliant when he wasn't around. <laughs> the, you've obviously made lots of interesting comments. But the one that I'm thinking about relevant to our conversation today is that, um, I hope you remember this. <laughs> if not, we'll believe you. <laughs> no. I'm sure he said it. No, I think that you're going to remember it. We were having this discussion um, in our conference room, and someone said... I really want to develop empathy for others. I'm trying to develop empathy. And you had a quick response. And your response was, spend a little less time 
watching sports and a little more time with the arts. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, now that's I not actually a, do. And I, I actually do remember that. And I know you love sports, so that's not a statement, uh, an anti-sports statement. But, yeah. but I think that was interesting. Why don't you build on that? Well, I, it dovetails into what Michael was saying about the universality of of art. Um, something that is funny in the 80s and is still funny today, but is funny in a different way. It It's just a gem that has so many different facets. And it's the same reason that we continue to look at Shakespeare. And it's the same reason that we continue to listen to Beethoven. And it... It doesn't matter what light you hold it up in, there's something to say to the audience of that time, regardless of what's happening politically or what's happening economically or in the world around them. And so the 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 same thing that a Renaissance audience seeing this in rags uh, might have seen in a play compared to our extremely rich and... Um, separated from each other by our cell phones culture the fact that that we are still getting something out of these plays is a remarkable testament to not just the beauty of the language and all the other things that we point out at Shakespeare but but the universality of human experience that that's what I think is the 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 true hallmark of the greatest art and and Shakespeare too, and lest people think because we're all sports people around here, right? Yeah. Um, my son is a soccer player, loves soccer. You know, his favorite teams to play is when he played international players, and Jamil, who I mentioned, this uh, uh, wonderful, uh, he's from Jordan, but uh, it, he speaks Arabic, uh, who plays the Prince of Morocco, who I was referring to. Uh, I said, "Have you hiked a canyon?" He goes, "And I love it." He said. But Sunday, I really have to go out and play soccer. So he goes and he meets with students from our university and plays with them. And my son talks about playing against a Hispanic team, playing against uh, an Anglo team, a German team, a French team, Japanese team. Uh, Every one of those players play a little differently and like that facet, like that art gem that you were talking about, uh, it's... It improved his game when he was able to develop skills playing against and with and infu- included with different different players. Does that make sense? And I, and I think it's exactly the same thing we're talking about here. He, get, he gets confronted with people that are from a different culture who have just a slightly different mm-hmm. take on the sport and have grown up doing it just slightly different. Mm-hmm. And his... Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, his goal was always to find other players that he had not played with so that he could improve his game uh, that way. And uh, I think if we looked at business, I think if we looked at art, I think if we looked at, you know, all humanity, you know, it isn't our game to, we want to improve our game, right? The way you improve your game is by exposing yourself to different ways and different tactics to imp- improve that game. It's different ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there are a lot of ways to do that, and arts, the arts are certainly one of the mm-hmm. more successful ways. Yeah. We didn't talk about The Liar either, which is also in the oh, fall, right. a great French uh, comedy, and uh, it's about a uh, <laughs> a master, if you will, who only lies, and a servant who can only tell the truth. A really, really funny comedy uh, that comes here. But there's also this same inclusion thing that's tied in through there as, as those two choices kind of feed off each other. And there's the Iliad, which is the one-man show that talks about, did I say the Iliad? It's actually an Iliad, um, which talks about war, bloodshed, you know, throughout mm-hmm. history and time. Uh, and we were talking about that show this morning because we've all heard of the Iliad. We all know that great Greek, Homer, the poet. The show opens with him talking about where these warriors are from, and he mentions Cedar City, and he mentions Kansas, and he mentions all of these different places. There's a list of hundreds of wars that are listed within the production, and you personalize. um, And there's a woman in the Grove this morning, we do a lot of stuff in that Grove, who started to weep, and she said, that story would where he talked about the soldier who had a scholarship but wasn't able to accept it because he died. 
is that a true story? And she's weeping as she's telling it. And I said, I'm not sure if the playwright, when they wrote this play based on Homer's The Iliad, had that. But the fact that you're crying now tells me that the story's probably true. There are people who went to war and died and were not able to accept their scholarships. And uh, whether the playwright actually based this in someone personally, we all know. So it's the personal that connects us with the art, um, coming full circle to why the arts do what they do. Yeah. I, um, I have a chance to travel to China at least once a year. And on one of those occasions, visited uh, a partner school of ours that and they took me through their art building. I saw dance, painting, calligraphy, music. And uh, it, it's too long to explain in this podcast, but I understood more about Chinese culture after spending two hours <laughs> yep. um, there than I had in all of the rest of my time. It's just so interesting how seeing... Um, the arts helps us put it's true just it's just it's just been it was it's, such a fascinating it's experience. what steve just said it, it's again it's the humanity it, it's that expression it's uh, humanity i think this ties in can i tie go for it yeah have you talked on this podcast about what happened during thunder you when all those incoming freshmen walked in the pouring rain. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we, have not. we haven't. So uh, they've got a memory, man. They were literally baptized into, you know, that, that <laughs> downpour. So for those of you that know Cedar City, it's, uh, I mean, it just didn't, it didn't dump. It hailed and it rained and it just came down. And they were giddy running away. This is, this is the, f so SUU has yeah. an interesting tradition. And the tradition is, like everyone else, when you have commencement, we get in our robes and we march. But at SUU, we have, we have the other end of the bookshelf, which is when the freshmen start, they do the same march in reverse. In red shirts, marching red shirts. up. I'm, I'm not sure what... How, how, We're if, all in our robes, but they haven't graduated yet, yeah. so they're wearing... So it's a thousand plus. Um, we, have, we have over 2,000 freshmen. Two, oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, anyway, they're all they're all marching up, and it thunderclap. Just <laughs> the arts analogy is coming shortly. I mean, thunder, 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 <laughs> hailstones that are <laughs> biblical in proportion. Oh, biblical, yeah. Uh, I'm just waiting for the lotus to come out. They were, they were. <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> it was huge. And, well, and uh, our and our mascot is the thunderbird. So every time you heard a thunderclap. You'd hear this, yay, all these cheers from the yeah. students as they <laughs> jumped in the water and cheered yeah. the thunder. I'm sitting here thinking, uh, you know, we're pretty high up here, you know. Please, <laughs> no one get hit here, you know. And it's just thundering and lightning and all that type of stuff. And right off to the side, not even off to the side, just packed in the middle, is a drum core that is... And they played through the whole thing. Uh and there's video footage of them, you know, just, and there's there's water flying off of the... And hailstones. Uh, and hailstones that are coming off, I think, that too. Uh, and I thought, look at the music that's binding here, both that the gods are throwing down at us <laughs> and that the, the music here. And I, I do think, and there's plenty of research, I'm looking at Steve right now, that talks about how um, they say that all art first started with uh, man's trying to connect with the divine. So there are dances that take place, you know, within temple rituals, theater in temple rituals, music and song, temple ritual, telling story around the fire, etc. cetera. Um, and as I saw that just celebration of the elements and students coming in and then, they said, even here, the arts are present and alive <laughs> yep. and pounding. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yep. <laughs> well, so our, 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 um, our struggle is, mm -hmm. is to um, continually improve as a humanity and to find means with which we can help facilitate those improvements. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways to do that. 
and certainly one is the arts, and that's something that we've made a real focus on this year, and uh, it's been fun to watch your plays where everyone has a slightly different take on inclusion and where we see face-to-face the evils of um, non-inclusion, non-inclusion, intolerance, and the difficulties that, that humans... I, I remember once going on a trip somewhere um, and taking with me the Oxford Short History of the World. I think that was the name of the book. <laughs> and I got a third of the way through it and I thought, yeah, this book is kind of like... Every chapter is one civilization kills another one, and then you move on to the next chapter, and then one civilization kills another one. Have you seen the Iliad? It was the most depressing book. Have you seen the Iliad yet? Not yet. Uh, it, so, yeah, it's not fair for me to, uh, but you've got plenty of time to see it. I am it, going to see it. It will, st- I know you will, because you see everything, but it will, st- and it's early, early on in its run, it will stick with you. We had patrons coming up and saying, I bought a ticket to the, there's this one man show with Brian Vaughn in it called An Iliad, and I have tickets to Merry Wives. And they were talking and raving about how they were touched and moved and tears, you know, about this. And it talks about that very same thing mm-hmm. about we had this war, and then we had this war, and then we had this war, and the wars don't stop. And one of the patrons said, yeah, but as he was making that list of wars, this war's okay. And this war, <laughs> yes, those words came out of his mouth. And I understood what he was saying. He said, it seems like there's, I get there's a kind of anti-war agenda that we shouldn't be fighting, but this war is okay. And then I countered with, so what wars are okay and what wars are not okay? And it's like this Oxford history of the world. You know, when do we learn? You know? When uh, do we learn? I got I got a third way through the book and thought, I'm sick of this. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> yeah. You'll uh I want to talk to you. We don't have to do it on mic, but I want to talk to you after you get done seeing the show because of the kind of personal connection that comes through. And I again I've I've always been grateful. I'm a product of Southern Utah University. Um Went to school here, left, taught school, have returned again. And I'm grateful f- for the embryonic connection that the festival has with uh, with SUU. Uh, because I think they're, we serve as catalyst to each other. Um, institution of higher learning and the theater is also an institution of higher learning. And we are both there learning together. Um I can't imagine working for a theater company that wouldn't have this type of post-show discussion whenever I go there, out and see There has to be a purpose behind yeah. what we do. Otherwise, you know, why are we yeah. doing it? And so consequently, we select shows that, as you know, you see the budgets. Wow. <laughs> hmm. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. yeah. We, know why, we know why we're doing this one. I sure hope it makes a little more money. And then there's another one here. But that higher purpose of we're doing this this, the purpose of this is to educate. The purpose of this is to help us get where we have to go. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University. We've had as our in-studio guest Michael Barr, the director of education for the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Thanks for joining us, Michael. And thank all of you for listening. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.